I am the um, continuing education director at Nearman Practice Management and the executive, executive director of the Scope Institute for Sleep Apnea and Craniofacial Pain Education. And as Courtney said earlier, we are here with our Nearman Practice Management Study Club on Tuesday. So I want to thank everybody for spending their Tuesday evening with us. And it's going to be a great webinar that we have planned for you, which is our interview with a sleep apnea and cranial facial pain dentist. And he's not just a dentist. He is Dr. Mayor Patel, DDS, MS. And uh, he is the clinical director of, um, for Nearman Practice Management for our education. And Dr. Patel, um, I was on his website today and he lists his mission statement as, um, which I, I found very appropriate. Dr. Patel's mission is to help dentists better understand the areas of cranial facial pain and dental sleep medicine so they can effectively treat their patient's symptoms. And uh, I really like that because it aligns so well with our company, Nearman Practice Management, and what our mission is, which is to help dentists implement sleep apnea, craniofacial pain treatment, and help our practices implement the medical billing so they can help their patients get these, make these treatments accessible and get these treatments. And we've been working with Dr. Patel with our courses since 2014, and we've just aligned so well with our missions and our passions in, in these fields and educating our, these dentists so they can help their patients. And so it's, uh, it's been a, a very exciting journey so far, and we're glad to have you with us today, Dr. Patel. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, Rose, and everybody else in the unit as well. I appreciate the opportunity. So before we get started, I want to, um, I'll have Courtney launch the polls that we have. We want to get a little more familiar with you guys, our attendees, and see, uh, you know, the landscape of, of who we have here with us and, and where you're at in your sleep and TMD journey. And um, so Courtney started the poll right now. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to, or a couple seconds to um, answer the questions. We only have three questions, so you don't have to feel pressured. And um, first question, why did you decide to attend this webinar? So we just want to get a lay of the land and, and see who we have on here with us today. Yeah, now that first question there does allow you to select um, as many are as applicable, and um, the other two are just um, single choice questions. So we'll give everybody just a few minutes to, to log their answers in, and we'll share the results when, when I um, see that most of you have answered. <laughs> there we go. I see the votes rolling in now. <laughs> So while we're waiting, uh, we have a, a course coming up this weekend in, in Scottsdale, Arizona. If anyone doesn't have any plans this weekend, there's still some room <laughs> to come attend. It's our Pinpoint the Pain course, uh, differential diagnosis of TMD and craniofacial pain going on this weekend in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's going to be a great one. be great to see you, Dr. Patel, and teach that course. It's going to be a, a really great program. So yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's a good program that came up a couple of years ago. You know, as dentists, we are in the field to try and help diagnose appropriate uh, pain. A lot of times, we diagnose something, we treat it, and it doesn't go as well as we predicted. And the idea for that program is to really get you to think and think about differential diagnosis, think about why they may have what they have, and here just to try and sharpen up your diagnostic skills when it comes to facial pain. So it's definitely a good program for those that want to expose themselves to just being in a better position to identify and diagnose really cases. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, great. It looks like uh, the, the votes are starting to slow down. I'll give everybody uh, 10 more seconds to log in their last answers and I'm going to end off the poll and you'll 
uh, see the results come up on the screen. Okay, great. You'll see the results on the screen there. Um, so great. Um, for why did everybody choose to attend the webinar? Um, we had a strong presence to see Dr. Mayer's uh, pretty face, so that's that's great. 14% uh, <laughs> there just for that. 24% uh, <laughs> have heard Dr. Patel speak before, either in person or online. 38% looking to make sleep a bigger part of the practice, and 24 for TM, JD, or craniofacial pain. 43% um, that want to make both a bigger part of their practice. 62% uh, is our, our top for this. 62% uh, looking to learn about building referral relationships with other doctors. 19% um, on uh, tweaking or fine tuning their protocol. 10% uh, not exactly sure, but excited to learn. So <laughs> great to have everybody. Um, number two, does your practice currently screen for and or treat sleep in TMJD or cranial facial pain? 29% uh, screening and treating both. 14% treating and screening for sleep only. 5% for TMJD only. 10% screening for both only. 14% um, just getting started with screening for both. 5% just getting started with um, screening or treating uh, TMJD only. And then 19% that haven't started screening or treating just yet. Uh, last question about billing medical insurance. Um, does your practice currently bill medical insurance? Now, uh, we do have some, some international folks on the line too, so um, that may not apply to everybody, but 14% billing medical insurance for both. 24% for sleep only, 10% just getting started, and 57% that haven't tried yet. So um, thanks so much for, for sharing that and gives us a great idea of who we've got on the line. And I think uh, Dr. Patel is gonna have some really wonderful things to share with you guys. Yeah, that'd be great. Good to know that. Awesome. All right, well, let's uh, dive right in and get started. Sounds fine. All right. I'm gonna stop my video so I'm not distracting everybody. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, for those of you who who um, are familiar with Dr. Patel, and and for those of you who aren't, um, as I mentioned before, he's our clinical director of education at Nearman Practice Management. But he's so much more than that. That if I listed out all of his credentials it would take up the whole hour of our webinar. So I'm not gonna do that. Um, and I would fumble around on all of them, but no, but it's just, it's very impressive. And that's, I think, what, um, you know, we, when we keep coming back to, um, when I asked Dr. Patel, you know, what's, what's the secret and everything? And he always tells me there's really no secret. And it's just, you know, putting the work in and being passionate about it and, and if you want to do it, you can you can do it and you can make it happen. And I think, you know, there's there's really no secret ingredient that he has that nobody else has. It's just that he's put the time in and he's put the work in and he has that passion. So, Dr. Patel, um, you were recently the recipient of the Honorable Hayden Stack, Hayden Stack Award at the AACP annual meeting in July in Kansas City. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with that award, it's given to those who have made significant contributions to the advancement of knowledge and clinical practice in the diagnosis and treatment of craniofacial pain and temporal mandibular disorders. Um, and it started with Dr. Um, Brendan Stack and Jack Hayden. And um, I wanted to ask you, what does this achievement mean to you? Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I'm very grateful that the committee, which are the previous Hayden Stack uh, awardees, um, nominated me for the uh, award, for the 20th award. You know, going to the ACP meetings over many years, we would sit in the crowd, and when they're getting ready to announce names, we would like kind of 
amongst ourselves say, hey, I think this person's going to get it or this person's going to get it. But I never thought my time was now to receive that. Uh, in my opinion, I feel I'm still too young uh, to have received it. After checking with Dr. Jameson Spencer, which I thought was the youngest recipient, turns out that um, I now am the youngest recipient to receive the Hayden Sack Award. I think looking up to those two peers, Jack as well as Brendan, and having the opportunity of learning from them and being recognized by their, again, their predecessors in regards to providing education has really made me feel much, much more honorable and really wants me to give as much as I can, being that I'm so young. <laughs> and I'm using that word loosely, but I feel I'm young, and I think I still have some uh, pump, a pump in me to get as much information and knowledge out there as best as possible. So I'm grateful. I'm really grateful for it. Still hasn't completely sunk in, but um, I do get reminded about it every so often. Yeah. That, I mean, it's, it really is an incredible achievement, especially uh, knowing that you are now the youngest recipient of the award. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a really special special award and when we we saw that and we heard about that we were um very very happy to see that and um I, I think it's amazing so um congratulations on that achievement again and um thank you yes so um for those of you who don't know dr patel was actually born and raised in south africa where the accent comes from and graduated from the University of Tennessee with his uh, DDS at the age of 22. Is that, is that right? That's right. So I wanted to ask, how was growing up in South Africa different than America? And what made you decide to pursue dentistry initially in the first place? So growing up, in, well, so just to clarify, I use the word South Africa because where I'm from is actually Zimbabwe, which is Southern Africa, just north of South Africa, a small little uh, landlocked country that looks like a little kettle. Um, growing up in Southern Africa or Zimbabwe at the time uh, was wonderful, really good experiences. Uh, to be honest with you, if you knew my background, you'd be amazed where I am today. Um, if we ever get a chance to talk about my childhood stories, you'll really get an understanding why. But I had no interest in pursuing education. Uh, education happened to fall upon me because of my mom. And if it wasn't for my mom, I don't believe I'd be here where I am today. My goal going through middle school and high school was to just get through school and open up a little clothing shop. And what inspired me to do the clothing shop is all my friends' parents had retail stores. And I just felt that this is the life. You go to work, you stand behind the counter, you eat what you want, you drink what you want, and you go home. But in all fairness, looking back now, if it wasn't for my mom and uh, her pushing me to the point of actually sending me out of the country at the age of um, 18, sorry, at the age of 16 to go to college, um, I would not be here in the States pursuing my education. The sad thing with Africa or in Zimbabwe, we only have one university for 10 million people. So the odds of getting in were extremely low. And the advantage of coming abroad or going abroad for those that could was the ability to further your education. So, you know, I do appreciate my great upbringing, but I truly do have to dedicate the whole idea for dentistry being my mom. Nice. Very yeah. nice. So, and now your practice is exclusive to dental sleep medicine and cranial facial pain treatment. You don't even do dental That's right anymore so no. I want to know what made you so passionate about these fields and when did you know that you wanted this to be your focus and not mm -hmm. general dentistry so graduating in 94 from Tennessee I stayed behind and did a one-year AGD uh, the reason for that AGD was I couldn't get employed I'll give you one story I remember going for an interview uh, in 90, 90, uh, 94 and the gentleman comes out to the waiting room and says, well, let me know when your dad gets here. I'm like, excuse me? I'm the one that's interviewing for the job because well, I can't hire you. You look too young. You're too young. And I was like, shucks. I had to do something. It just so happened that a spot opened up at the university to do a one-year AGD. So after completing AGD and coming to Metro Atlanta, this is just before the Olympics when the city was booming, there was a lot of opportunities. 
Uh, I worked with a corporate chain for about a year, year and a half, and I just didn't like the politics associated with it. So me and my roommate from Dell School opened up a practice, and we, it was a practice solely devoted to the standard general dental procedures that we were taught in school to do. Well, then from 97 up to about 2002, whether it's my insecurity at the time or however you want to express it, I felt I was just getting burnt out with general dentistry. About that same time period, I happened to have the opportunity to listen to Harold Gelb in Chicago, April of 2002. And a few things he said applied to me because as a child going through dental school, I used to have what I thought was just head neck pain, but didn't realize it was actually a pre-existing temporal mandibular joint issue that never was identified nor was it ever treated. And when I spoke to Harold on the second day, he goes, you know, son, what you're describing to me is exactly what we treat. Why don't you go home, take your model, do a little wax bite, check the bite in your mouth, send it off to a laboratory and wait for the device to show up. Device shows up two weeks later, I put it in my mouth and within a day or two, everything clears up. And I was like, it can't be, it just can't be. So I removed the device and everything returned. And that was my impetus to really understand what this whole TMD, TMJ area was. In 2002, because of him and my own experience, I spearheaded me to pursue as much education as I possibly could. And that's what kind of got me into this field. Yes. And uh, so I remember you saying, um, while we were at the New York City continuum that we just did, and we have a couple of attendees on from that program that we we just did which was at uh -huh. michael gelb's office which used to yeah. be harold gelb's office and yeah. you kind of said uh you know it, everything came full circle for you yes because harold gelb mean, got you into this because be, and so true and i had the opportunity of actually standing in his operatory and snapping a picture because i mean this man pioneered this field and I was standing on the same floor, same operatory where he was, where he treated hundreds and hundreds of patients. So it really felt uh, fulfilling. It really felt like a complete closure. You know, you bring up the closure point, and I, this is an aftermath after getting the Hayden Stack Award. My first academy meeting in facial pain was in Kansas City in 2002 or 2003. And the award I received happened to be in Kansas City. And this meeting has never come back to Kansas City until this past year. That's so right. it's just funny how things work out. That's great. That is really cool. So my next question relates to this too is, so after you started getting into these areas, how did you make your transition from general dentistry into limiting to pain and sleep dentistry? Yeah. And this is an interesting question that comes up many a times from individuals that are trying to change the dynamics of their practice. So in the beginning, I mean, the idea was to try and get patients. Now, the internet was somewhat big at the time, but the biggest way to get referrals was really to knock on doors and try and get uh, your medical colleagues. And at the time, we were thinking of our dental colleagues to refer to us, but we were doing general dentistry. And what we did is we blocked out half a day a week we only, only patients we would book were patients that had pain issues. And as the half days would fill up, we would go to a full day. As a full day would fill up, we would go to a day and a half. And we progressively started bringing in more pain patients, which then also led to sleep patients and started shying away from general dentistry. But the biggest turning point was the day we decided not to do general dentistry. But we would get a referral here and there from oral surgeons for sure, or GPs, not as much. Uh, uh, advertising had paid off at that time and some from the internet. But um, when we actually shut our doors and decided not to do general dentistry is where we saw a significant increase in referrals. And um, that's when we started going with it uh, full speed. Nice. I mean, just to add also, I was asked some time back, um, how long did it take you to establish yourself? Mm -hmm. And okay, the argument people bring up is the demographics we are in, which maybe has some role to play, but we were in the northern suburb of Metro Atlanta, and people from within the city or the surrounding areas would not drive up to the suburb we were. So our 
bread and butter when it came to pain and also sleep at the time was within probably a 15 mile radius of where we were. It took about a good three and a half years where we started having full one or two days consistently where we could start shying away from actually doing general dentistry. So it did, it did take a, a number of years uh, to get to that point. The transition, yes. To transition, exactly. And so did you, you started slowly, you know, adding more, de dedicating more days just to, you know, pain and sleep? That's correct. Correct. And what was the, the final trigger that you said, I'm, I'm doing it? I'm just going to go all in. So 2008 was probably when we were just full-time doing pain and sleep. The only patients we had on the wall were patients that were from our older GP days that just didn't want to leave us. So we would bring a hygienist in twice a week, and we would just deal with them. And as they attritioned away, we would not replenish our GP patients. But then in 2012, we had the opportunity of a dentist buying out our practice. And when that actually occurred, it was the time for me to just cut it clean and start from scratch again and just have a pain and sleep practice exclusively with no general dentistry being performed. And that was roughly in uh, November of, sorry, in June of 2012. What are the three most important things that you did that helped you grow your sleep and pain practice? So we would do uh, Thursday evenings, we would do uh, wine and hors d'oeuvres, and we would try and bring as many people into the office at uh, 5.30 p.m. And we would do probably no more than a 45 minute quick discussion about what TNJ disorders are, what can we do for your patients, kind of just plant the seed. And we would fax invitations, cold called offices, and there were days that only two people would show up, and there were days that maybe 15 people showed up. So it was never anything that was predictable, but we consistently did that for a good year, year and a half. Uh, besides that, the really biggest turning point was when I discovered Dental Writer. And that was also in my early years, probably 2002, 2003. And it was a pearl that Rose had shared with us that when you get new patients, send letters to everyone, everyone that they have actually seen, everybody that they've actually had a discussion with, get the informed consent and, then re and write letters to them. And I would say that probably the number one biggest referral into the practice is letters that we've written. And how we know this is because we've actually sent letters to physicians or dentists that have never referred to us before, because the name is not in the software. And then at some point, we get a referral from them. And these are also practices that we've never really cold called, nor have we approached. So we've had the opportunity of tracking this as well. And uh, the letter writing has been a big, 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 big plus uh, in our practice. So our goal when we have a new patient is to get all the names possible, the primary care physician at least, the dentist at least. Most of them, if they came from an ENT because of ear-related symptoms, we want the ENT's name, sometimes the neurologist's name. Uh, if they've seen a PT or a chiropractor, whoever's touched them for that condition, I want to know who they were, and they will get correspondence from us. So that's <laughs> been the biggest. Here's a fun question. How many letters do you think you've generated from Dental Rider since 2002? How many? So I don't know, but I will tell you this. When I had to transfer my database from my server to your web base, and uh, your IT guy is like, this is the largest amount of volume of data we've ever transferred. So that may tell you that it's probably up there. I'm sure there's a way to run analytics on it, but we generate at least three to four letters per patient. Uh, the letters would be when they first come in, the first encounter we have with them. The second would be when we initiate treatment with them. And then the final letter will be when we reach medical, med medical improvement or in the sleep case, they've reached their subjective improvement and now we need to get them tested. So every client will get three sets of letters that will be mailed out to their appropriate uh, practitioners. So I don't know, John, if there's a way to find that number, I'd like to know myself, but um, it's our workhorse. Yeah, you've, you've done a, a good job keeping the Postal Service in business. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then I, I also get asked the question, why don't you fax? And there's nothing wrong with faxing, but what we've learned is as we send these letters, we also send a flyer about the services we provide on a nice glossy piece of paper. So we're using the mail as marketing as well as the letter to receiving, and we try and use the mail as much as we can. 
that we go through rolls of scam probably weekly. I've noticed that as well, just in our own field, is that, you know, we, we have all sorts of forms of communication, fax and email, but with the mail, it's, it, it seems like people really open the, the letters that they get, uh, no matter what it is. I think, I mean, in all fairness, we get so many emails that it would be nice to get a piece of paper every now and then. And uh, depending on what that paper is, of course, a bill is not a good idea. But I mean, for what it's worth, I think so. Using the mail as a vehicle, also tradition office, we also tear out a couple of referral slips and slip it in with the letters. So we always make sure that they plunge with referral slips. If they want a referral pad, they call the office, we mail that to them. But we also have the referral slips online so they can just print it off immediately if the patient's there and not have to wait for this to be uh, faxed or mailed to them. Nice. So these are little things that really helped the referral process uh, into the practice. Yes, and as since we did that poll and we, we, we saw a lot of the people on here tonight are interested in you know, how to get those referrals, how to really build those referral networks. So I think this is a, a hot topic right now and um, it kind of leads into my next question. How do most of your patients, your new patients hear about you? Do you is it mostly referral based or are there other methods, you know, word of mouth from your patients online or so is it mainly referral based? Oh, well five years, what we found is the number one referral source is actually the uh, dentist and physician. Uh, the second largest referral base into the practice is actually the internet. Um, the third is patients within the practice, but the largest chunk, which we get faxes pretty much on the hour, will get referral slips to these patients when they walk in, are from providers. And there again, it took some time to get, your, get my name out there, but it can be done. Uh, the more you you know, actively engage with your possible potential referrals, uh, bring them into the office. Uh, do a, we still also do lunch and learns at one point where sometimes it's difficult for them to come in on a Thursday, but they were interested. We would buy lunch and we would actually show up at the office and do a 40 minute presentation, answer any questions, and then go back to the office. So that was also another method of uh, building referrals was doing in office lunch and learns. It does take time, it does take energy. Sometimes you feel like it's a waste. But if you give it time and you track it, you will see benefits from it. And it does pay off. It definitely does pay off. Would you say that that could be the difference between a practice that's getting into these areas where, you know, if they, if they have a hard time or they, they're not even actively working on building these relationships do you think that could make the difference between them growing their practice and them kind of being stagnant is those referral relationships? Yeah, and I, would, I can back that up as well. So I, the answer is yes, for sure. Um, we have had the opportunity through Nearman to have patient, uh, doctors shadow us when they come to the office, they see us work, and then a few would have them, would follow up with us and ask them to guide them or help them uh, make, become an exclusive practice. So the ones that actually took our advice dearly, and I'll give you an example of one in particular, they would book out Mondays and Thursdays for pain and sleep and do general dentistry Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. But they also had an associate which would cover the Mondays and Thursdays. Well, in the beginning, it's slow, right? So it takes a while to kind of build, a, build your patient base. So initially, the practice was not developing or growing. And as we tracked it over the course of time, we realized that the days that there was no one in the practice, as far as patients, the doctor was free at will to do whatever they wanted to do, but they didn't take the initiative to knock on doors. But when we talked about it and kind of got them excited about it, within three and a half months, they started getting referrals from practices that they did not even hear about, let alone had any communication with, but the mere fact of cold calling and trying to just get their name out there paid off. So my point here is if you dedicate time, then even if you don't have patience that time, that's your time to go knock on doors and build relationships. Now, the reason I can back this up is we've got other offices that do the total opposite of what we say, and they still call me or they'll still email me saying that, hey, I've not got any referrals, I've only seen one in the past three weeks. And when we start questioning them, the difference being is they need to be proactive. They need to get out there and put their name out there. And it does, in all fairness, pay off. But you gotta be patient. And how many would you say, like, you don't need to 
connect with every physician in your area. You know, you just need to have success with a couple, right? And that's- I would agree. So let me give you last year's example. So Christmas time, we track every referral that comes in the, in the office. Uh, any office that sends us three or more patients throughout the year, we make sure they send, we send them a beautiful basket. So last year, three or more were only 47 offices. So 47 offices were solid referrals to the point that I was at least getting three referrals a year from them, enough to sustain a good living. And don't get me wrong, with 47 referral practices. When it came to, and that's for pain specifically, uh, when it came to sleep, it's only four practices that I actually refer, and it's only four practices that I work with closely the others just trickle in from the internet or the GP happens to send them in my way or a general dentist. But we have a good four practices that pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis, I will receive faxes from them to contact the offices. So point being, to your point, John, you don't have to knock on every door and have everybody refer to you. You just need a solid few, and that's all it takes to stay extremely busy. Would you say that if, if you can document some really good case studies, uh, you know, uh -huh. before and after successes with, with your sleep cases or your, your pain patients. But let's talk sleep okay. right now and say, you know, you can get, you, you get a patient's AHI, AHI down um, to mild or, or, or get it down from, you know, whatever to a, a really good level where they're, okay. they're breathing better. Is, is that, does that make a difference if you if you're having those documented cases, those case studies that you can present to referring physicians? Does does that seem to 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 matter, or is it more just kind of connecting with them and just staying on top of them and and just saying, hey, you know, I'm here, and or is it the case studies that really seem to make the difference? You know, so there has been a few skeptical physicians that uh, had the mindset that oral appliances don't work. And for those, we actually presented them an Excel spreadsheet with statistics broken down between mild, moderate, and severe, the number of patients we've treated, the pre and post uh, AHI averages, and what success is defined as AHI less than five for mild, less than 10 for moderate, and more than 50% reduction for severe. And we would track this over a course of time. So the fact that you brought this up, I'll show you my numbers. So in my hands, taking uh, mild apnea, I can get the AHI down below 5, 86% of the time. If I were to look at moderate apnex to get the AHI below 10, I can pull that off about 79% of the time. And for severe apnex to reduce the AHI by more than 50%, uh, we can actually pull that off 97% of the time. However, if I take the severe and I use the criteria of bringing them below 10, which is what we'd use for moderate patients, then the success rate with oral plants in my hands for them is only about 63%. But when you show them these numbers and they see that you've treated cases and you've got pre and post numbers to support it, they get it. Not everybody are candidates for oral appliances. And in some cases, you may not get them completely better, but the fact that they can sleep better, they don't have any interruptions per se, and the oxygen level has significantly improved versus no treatment at all, they all for it. So yes, having collateral about what works in your hands is important. Because if you pull the literature and you look at what the literature supports as far as success rate, it ranges anywhere from 33% to 62%. So the numbers in the literature are very small, but there's a lot of problems with some of these studies. For example, what was the pre-test, post-test? Was titration performed? There's just too many elements that have not been controlled. Whereas in your hands, with your comfort level and how aggressive you are as far as moving the mandible forward and dealing with any minor issues that may arise, you're going to get good outcomes. So it's wise to... Um, track it absolutely and of course share it so that's a good pearl then to start you know yes, documenting sure. every case keep a spreadsheet and start building some some case studies that you can exactly. share with your your medical community that's exactly. great exactly all right let's uh let's move on a little bit to a, a different direction um i thought this was an interesting question um so you lecture about every other weekend and not just in the United States, but also in the UK and even Australia. Um, what are some common myths or misconceptions that you hear from dentists new to these fields that you encounter um, during your lectures? And you know, maybe you know, common 
questions or statements that you receive or you hear a lot that people, dentists seem to have when they're first getting started? So I guess the biggest question that comes up, um, comes to mind really is, uh, can I make it happen? In other words, can I sustain living by doing this sleep? Or in some cases, can I do it just by doing pain? And there'll be a few that'll say, I want to do sleep first and I'll get into pain or vice versa. And it's a question that comes up because a lot of them feel that they still need to perform or continue with general dentistry. And in all fairness, if you enjoy it, definitely continue doing it. There's nothing wrong with it. But you also need to then realize that if you want to have a sleep practice or a pain practice, you've got to kind of invest some energy and effort into it as well. Now, if you look at numbers, and I remember doing, giving a talk not so long ago, uh, people were afraid that you can't sustain living during just pain and sleep. And if you look at the number of practices out there that just have exclusive practices that are pain and sleep, it's probably just under about 80 practices uh, when we look at North America in general. But you look at general dentists, you have 3,000 general dentists in Metro, Metro Atlanta as an example. You have two or three within a mile of each other, and they all do well. But they're all also fighting for the same patient base. Now, with the pain or sleep practice, if you look at the numbers, there's 13 million sufferers out there with temporal mandibular joint disorders. They just don't know where to go. A uh, majority of them are sitting in a neurologist's office because they're dealing with the headache component of it. A vast majority are probably at a chiropractor's office because of uh, neck-related issues associated with jaw. And then you may have a handful that are fiddling between pain management and maybe ENTs because of symptoms they have. All you need to do is educate your peers, and they have patients already that they really can't help, but they're just medicating and buying time, that they are more than happy to dump on your lap. And I say this sincerely because that's exactly what happens, is they'll have a situation where they treat them with what they think they have, it doesn't get better, and they dump them on you. If you just gave that some time, there's enough people out there suffering. They just need to know who you are, and you can make it happen. Um, you know, I don't know if I want to say this, but I guess maybe to illustrate the point, I only work three days a week. And we work three good long days. And I have actually been, do I've done more revenue doing pain and sleep three days than I ever did working five or five and a half days doing general dentistry. Just to give you a comparative analysis of what this looks like. Um, so that being said, it can be, and the biggest myth I get is, can I make a living out of it? So, yeah. Awesome. And along the same lines, what is a pearl or an insight for dentists that are just starting out in sleep or pain after having taken, you know, a course or two? Uh, what's a good pearl for them? Yeah, I think like everyone else, we'll take a course, we'll hear something, and then it's kind of on the back burner. Uh, what I encourage you to do is take a program, review your information, and just start doing it. You're going to make mistakes. Trust me, I've made many a mistake. And even now and then, I'll make a mistake. But the good thing with our mistakes, it's not life-threatening. In other words, if things don't go the way they should, all it means is you need to sit down for a minute, reassess what you may have overlooked, and then go down that path. That being said, you do not need to be afraid of pain and sleep. Because at the end of the day, no one's really helping these patients. What I encourage you to do is get some sound education, get, some, get a mentor, and just start tackling this. Start seeing your patients, start trying something. And you're probably going to learn more from your mistakes than you're ever going to learn by just listening to someone lecture on a specific topic. So my biggest thing there is really just don't sit on it. Get that knowledge and start implementing it. And it does and it will, uh, it will pay off. I love that. That's great advice. Um, and... Again, what's another pearl for dentists that have been involved in these areas for some time but feel like they've hit a, pla a plateau? Maybe they, plateau. You know, they're kind of staying where they are in these areas and they're looking to grow, but, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, when you talk about plateaus, a couple of things come to mind. One is when you have a practice that does just say, for example, sleep. And it got to the point that now sleep is busy enough but it's the same redundant thing every day. And it sucked out a little bit of excitement. And those are the practices that say, look, you already know how to use oral appliances. You're already using sleep appliances that actually moves the mandible forward. If you just got a little bit of better understanding of pain and brought that into your sleep practice, 
that's a whole other area of excitement and a whole other area of uh, revenue source. So one might be there's to cross over. If you have a sleep background, then go down the sleep background, make that successful and then bring the pain. Or if you have a pain background, then consider doing sleep. And by doing both, you really adjunct both aspects of it. Um, you know, the other thing when you hit that plateau is take more programs, advanced programs, uh, push yourself, uh, sometimes just go listen to a totally different presenter because everybody has specific pearls and experiences that may resonate with you. But for you to resonate, you're going to need to be exposed to them. So my encouragement is, look, I've been doing this for almost 15 some years and I'm still excited. Um, I still purchase textbooks. I still read these books. Um, and you learn so much more uh, just by exposing yourself to the material. I honestly don't think I'm at my pinnacle. I really think I'm in my infancy when it comes to this. But uh, the more you do it, uh, the more you're going to gain out of it. And really, the biggest reward for me is patience. Uh, they come in with attitudes. They come in with anxiety. They come in with uh, anger because they've been hurting for so long. And within three to six weeks of you doing what you do, they're totally different people. Um, and that's something that I look forward to when, as far as work is concerned. Who do I have today? What can I do for the individual? And let's see what happens to them at a specific time point. So, I mean, I find helping pain patients specifically a significant, um, I guess, adrenal rush as far as that's concerned. And from the sleep standpoint, honestly, it's not really the patient that benefits from it as much as it's the bed partners because you change their quality of sleep. Um, so there's different ways of looking at it, but regardless, where I'm going with this is tool yourself, switch over or cross over if you're not doing the other, and definitely listen to different presenters because you'll pick up a lot of different uh, nuances that will really help you uh, better yourself. I like that a lot, and uh, you know, I was um, thinking about that earlier, and you know, I, I think that's something that you say all the time that really sticks out to me is that you know, and, and that was your experience too, is you've gotten so many different perspectives on these topics. Mm -hmm. And that's what's, you know, you've, you've taken pieces here and there and, and pieces here and there, and you've, you've tried it on your patients and you, you've seen what works for you and, and thrown out what doesn't work for you. And you've come to really develop your own philosophy based off of that. And that's what we encourage our classes to do and our students and all of our attendees is to you know, get different perspectives too, not just us, but go out there and take other courses too and see what they have to say and try it out and see what works for them. Um, exactly. But we're not trying to say, you know, you have to do it this way and you, you have to follow everything that we say. It's more of an open-minded, uh, critical thinking type of environment that, that I think you have and that's what's, you, that's you, you, you've um, you know, developed with yourself and with your students. Yeah, and I mean, John, you bring up a point, critical thinking, and it's actually, that's exactly what this is. It's a thinking sport. You know, if you think of a dentistry, and I, reflecting back on my days, we were taught that you see something, you diagnose the problem, and you fix the problem, and you moved on. And it was all about identifying fix, identifying fix. There was very little thinking that needed to happen, for the most part. So that being said, when you change your mindset and you start looking at pain and sleep, it does involve a little bit of a thought process. And this is where you really push yourself and actually challenge yourself. But that's how medicine is. Medicine is more of a critical thinking sport than dentistry is. And maybe some, pa some practices uh, fall off the idea of wanting to do pain and sleep, but now they have to spend a little bit of time thinking the process through. Whereas prior in general dentistry, it was quite identifiable find a cavity, fix it, chip tooth, fix it, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Not to make you feel like it's simple, but you can kind of get the uh, analogy associated with how a pain and sleep practice would affect your capacity to perform versus um, a traditional uh, GP type of a practice setting. And, you know, I've done both, so I, I understand both sides of it, but uh, I really enjoy what I'm doing right now, so I'm a little biased there. <laughs> All right, so at this time, I'd like to open it up to our attendee questions. And we got some from the registrations that I'm going to read off to you. Um, but also in the meantime, 
Um, we do have one in the Q&A box. So if any of you guys want to ask Dr. Patel a question, we can take some questions right now if you want to use the Q&A um, part of the, the Zoom, or if you want to use the chat box, we'll take a couple questions. I'm going to start off with Dr. Viet, of course, and that's what I was saying. This is why we meet the attendees is because if we didn't, but he still came through with uh, his jokes. So how come Dr. Patel has the exact same shirt on on the photo in the video? Can I know where he bought them? <laughs> so you know what's funny is when I saw that picture, John, I even looked down to see him out wearing the same shirt. Um, <laughs> So I like this one brand and like the one cut that they have in this brand. And I pick up as many shirts as I can from this one product line. Uh, that being said, yes, the amount of times I've lectured, the amount of times I've uh, spoken, I'm sure these shirts cross over. But you know, the other way I look at it is like Einstein, just keep the same thing, never have to think twice. If you happen to wear it again, hey, it's a fresh pair at least. So I mean, for what it's worth, thank you for that observation, but um, yeah. Uh, I do like this cut or style of shirt. It is so funny. I, uh, I can always count on Dr. Viet to uh, lighten everything up. Um, I had a question from one of the registration attendees. Um, just let's see. Getting in, thinking of getting involved in TMJ patients and to broaden my knowledge so as to more effectively treat my patients. Um, I guess they're asking, you know, what what's the, the best way to start getting involved in TMJ? I think uh, the, the best thing to really do is just take a course, just expose yourself to the knowledge, uh, kind of get a sense of what this is all about, and then expound from there. Um, over a course of time, John and Rose have been very kind enough to allow me to develop some good programs. Uh, we start off with Pinpoint to Pain, which was very important at the time. Uh, and then we came up with Dr. Terry Bennett, and started a two-session uh, pain mini residency with some a lot of hands-on aspects. So there are ways to get some hands-on components and get a little bit more exposure. Um, there's also a specific course coming out, I believe, in January, which is just TMJ for the sleep dentist. So anything and everything you should know about the temporal mandibular joint that pertains to a practice that only does sleep-related services. And uh, I think in the very near future, John will maybe make the announcement of another type of a critical thinking program um, that is in the works of being developed to help you learn to go through the key thought processes and get, in this, get you comfortable with identifying what's wrong with the individual, the questions you should ask, and what are the treatment plans for them. And then the intention also is to bring up, if you did this treatment and it didn't go the way it did, what do you anticipate was wrong with it? So there are courses that you could take, but I would say if you're looking to do something, start off with some course, get yourself some exposure to it. And if it's, you know, if it tickles to you to the death that you want to learn more about it, then implement the other programs that are available. Yep. And uh, that course you're talking about, TMJ for the sleep practice, we're doing uh, January 25th, 26th in Jupiter, Florida. That's going to be um, an awesome course and um, a, a great intro to um, getting involved in TMJ. If, if you're, you know, have, have treated sleep patients and, and now you want to get into TMJ, or even if you're, you're new to both areas, um, because we're going to talk about a little bit of both. And um, the other one that we're doing that involves both that's coming up is also um, the correlation between airway bruxism and craniofacial pain. Again, in Jupiter, we got, these are our winter courses. We do our winter courses in, in sunny Florida. So for those of you thinking of uh, taking a course soon, it's a, a great facility. We, we do them in uh, our headquarters here. And the ABC course we've done for a couple of years now. And I just, I love this course because we talk about, um, you know, really screening, how to screen and identify your what who your sleep and, and pain patients are in your dental practice and that's it's it's such a great course for really getting more involved in these areas because it starts to change your whole mindset on mm -hmm. sleep and pain and and you, yeah. you, it, you we we talked to you about you know how to think like uh more of a on the medical side and, and 
and instead of just looking at uh you know bruxism and clenching and 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 other symptoms in the mouth as well but starting to think about every patient could be an airway patient could be a pain patient and there's a, a lot of comorbidities with these uh areas as well so that's a great course um for getting into tmj as well as the this one here so let's see next question yep Kevin's got an an a question. Do you mind if I go and answer, a question, uh, answer that question? Yes. Um, the question is, what is your feeling about the traditional pull forward bite as opposed to a 10 bite registration? So I don't have a problem with either two methods. I've done both methods in the past. The key would be your indicator for it. So if it's a situation where I'm trying to recapture a disc, and I need to really move the mandible somewhat more protrusively to be able to get it to reduce, I may go with a pull forward kind of a method. Um, I have done uh, 10 femoromuscular type bites in the past, but I've also done other methods. And at the end of the day, what I, in my opinion, honestly, is as long as you take the jaw forward off the retrodiscal tissue and give it a point to kind of allow the joint to recover, there's no golden position that this jaw needs to be in. And if you look at Hill Gelt, he talks about the four seven position that's using supplementary. You look at the tens, it's always gonna bring the jaw down and forward. If you look at the phonetic method, the swallow method, uh, line up the midline. I mean, there's so many methods out there, but they all kind of do the same thing at the end of the day. So I don't have a problem with it. I think it's just understanding why you're doing what you're doing and possibly when it's indicated uh, would maybe make your life a little bit difficult to or make it a little bit more easier to determine which method uh, you may want to employ. Alice has a great question. I mean, in the area of 30,000 patients, a 30,000 population, the pulmonologists and cardiologists are very resistant, even with case studies and her diplomate status with the American Board of Dental State Medicine. How can I get referrals? I've been in business for 12 years. Uh, their medical assistants tell me they don't do anything with their CPAP intolerant patients. Frustrating, they don't know I exist. Okay, so the pulmonologist and cardiologist. So the good thing is most of these patients will have a PCP. And if they have a PCP, go directly to the, uh, to the primary care physician. The reason for that is the primary care are probably dealing with comorbidities, whether it be asthma from a pulmonology standpoint or be uh, hypertension and cardiovascular issues from the cardiologist standpoint that they're probably co-managing. So what we found is if you get resistance from the referring physician, specifically the specialist, then go to your primary care level. If that fails, go to Facebook and go direct to consumer. And what I mean by that is educate the consumers that they have a choice. And the campaigns we ran were not along the lines that CPAP is not good for you. We would only target populations that were non tolerant to CPAP. Because once we got the consumers to contact the office and come in, we still needed to get a signature to allow us to proceed with the oral client therapy. And the majority of those signatures came from their primary care physicians that were more receptive to signing it. But these patients were getting treated. Um, I will share that one practice uh, go, happened to go direct to consumer with this one case in particular. This patient happened to go back to this uh, seat physician uh, for a follow-up. And uh, he's like, you know, I mean, this oral appliance therapy kind of thing. It's like, well, how do I know it's working? It's like, well, the dentist has performed the test. He goes, well, I want to do my own test. They performed the test, and he was astonished with the results that this gentleman got with the oral appliances. And he's one of my four referrals now. So it may come around when these patients go back for follow-up, but I would not be discouraged by it. 30,000 people, 28% of those 30,000 people have a problem. You got a gold money you're sitting on. I would go to PCPs. If that fails, I'll go direct to consumer. And hopefully that plays out, Alice. And let me know if he doesn't. I'll think of something else. <laughs> cool. Um, Alice, Dr. Basford has a question. Besides our courses, what courses do you recommend taking? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'll let you answer that. And I, I have a couple people too that we, uh, you know, we know very well that have some good, good courses. So, so, I mean, it really depends on the area you want to focus on. Um, if you're talking about pain, you only have two other choices. You may have the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain. They have a, a pain residency. Of course, Neiman has a pain residency as well. 
And the only other person that's really lecturing on this topic may be Jeremy Spencer or um, Steve Olmos. But that's your limitations as far as that's concerned. When it comes to sleep, you have a lot more choices. You have uh, Ken Smith, you have um, some of the, some of the uh, presenters at uh, Sleep Group Solutions, uh, fantastic presenters, have some great information. Uh, you also have Terry Bennett, you also have Shuresh that lectures for Neumann, but you'll get a totally different perspective as far as managing these cases. Um, and those will probably be my top recommendations when it actually comes to sleep uh, at the moment. Yeah, uh, I would say for it, it, for you know TMD and, and some other areas, um, we we've started exhibiting at um, the Clinical Mastery Series, and I I'm very impressed by by their speakers, um, Dr. Mike Smith, really great speaker, um, and. Dr. Sam Kress, he, he does a sleep course with them. That's pretty good that we were just at mm -hmm. in Phoenix. That, and, and he's just, he's got a, a really nice um, speaking style. But that's uh, probably more of an intro course, I'd say, for sleep. Um, but their, okay. their TMD and their, their other programs are, are very good. Um, and uh, just a very, very professional group. Uh, Dr. Mike Smith and um, BioResearch. They they have some some good programs too. You know, if you're using their equipment, especially if you're if you're um, involved in that. Um, what do you think of Mario Roccobato? I think they. Oh, he's a rock star. Yeah. If you can ever get a chance to listen to Mariano Roccobato, that's a physical therapist out of Chile. He does come to the states every so often, but um, yes, I have taken many courses through Mariano and every time I listen to speak again you always go home with more information um, the guy is just a wealth of knowledge so yes if you ever hear Mariano Roccobato or his name pop up in the States definitely take his program it doesn't come up here that often but when he does it's always a sellout yeah I, I just saw he was doing a program I think uh, I forget where it was so I, that's why I mentioned is it West Virginia yes yes no? with Dr. Yes. Gerber yes. yes. That's correct. So shout out to, to um, Dr. <laughs> Jay Gerber and Mariano Roccobato. Um, great program. And uh, I don't have the dates for that, but um, uh, just, just look, look them up. And um, if you're interested in getting a different perspective, you can't go wrong there. All right. Any other questions? Let's see. I think that's all we got. Uh, what do you think of uh, she, her next question? What do you think about sleep certified certification process? I'm not sure what she means by that. Do you know? I'm going to make the assumption, Alice, that you may be talking about the certified dentist credit, uh, status that you get from the uh, AADSM. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of thoughts when it comes to this. And there's a lot of arguments when it comes to this. <laughs> I'm not going to quote what you said, but um, I can understand what the rationale might be is to try and standardize. And the idea for standardizing is to try and kind of get everybody on the same page. But the question might be, does it have to come through only one organization? Can't others do the same thing? <laughs> and all the other things that you're sending might be so true, Alice. So um, for what it's worth, Unfortunately, in this day and age, if we want to go down that pathway, we're going to have to play by their game. But uh, that doesn't mean that the education needs to come from them. There's a lot of other great places to get a lot of clinical education that is very practical uh, for you to use than to just get didactic information over and over again. Awesome. Um, I wanted to, before we adjourn, I wanted to let everyone know what's going on for next year because we just launched uh, all of our dates and locations for next year and we have some really cool things going on, um, including our the courses that we just mentioned before, ABC coming up December 7th and 8th, love this course, TMJ for the dental sleep practice in January. And, you know, these programs are, are we, what we felt is, is needed and what people are, are looking for. So um, mark your calendars before you book anything else, make sure you, you mark these dates 
And um, if you're interested in a comprehensive program, we have our dental sleep medicine mini residency. Um, we have actually two opportunities and next year we are starting at March 8th and 9th and it's a four session program. It's gonna be amazing. This is the third time we're doing it through Scope Institute, which is a nonprofit. So if you are interested in getting those nonprofit credits to become a, a diplomat of the um, American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, you can uh, go through us. And um, we also are doing a oral facial pain mini residency too. And we this is our uh, third time doing this one as well. So it's gone very well. So we're doing it again. And what I love about these mini residencies is we limit it to only 23 people. So you get such a personalized hands-on experience. Um, and it's, it's very comprehensive with the amount of sessions that we do. So um, it's, it's been a great experience so far. And I know you and Dr. Bennett, have, that's like the 15th one you guys have done. And uh, yeah. you guys are very experienced at doing it, but uh, I, I love being the course provider for those. This is a new program that we've done uh, this year and we're bringing it back for next year, the appliance course for sleep and TMD, where we dive deep into the pros and cons of each appliance. We do hands-on sessions. We talk to you about how to work and communicate with the labs um, to get the best outcomes. And we even have our a guest speaker, who actually gives a lot of the course, um, True Function President Frank Madrigal, who, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, has over 20 years of experience as a lab tech and a, and a lab owner, and just has so much knowledge on working and fabricating appliances and um, getting the best outcomes and working with, with dentists and it's a fantastic program. Really looking forward to that one. We're gonna do that one in Atlanta. Can this, I add to that one? Yes. The previous one. One of the best parts to this program is Frank, he actually has taken the time to have stations where you have certain situations where you have to figure out why the device doesn't fit or what do you need to do to make it work. And it's true clinically certain scenarios and situations that you'll be faced with. And I think it's a set of five or six uh, case scenarios to get passed around the class. And it's to get you to think that when you have a device and this happens, then what would you do to rectify it and things of that sort? And I mean, we, we got a lot of good reviews when it came to that aspect of, wow, I got a lot more out of it because I got to see the dental lab aspect and also the little tricks and trades of what to do chair side to make things work better independently of the science and all the other things we talk about when it comes to um, appliance therapy. Just want to mention that. Yeah, he's the man. It's, it's such a great course. Uh, you know, again, I can't say enough about True Function Labs too. They just, they, they're such a, a big supporter of us and the education. They really, they truly believe that that's where it all begins is, you know, just got to get the dentist and the whole team educated and that's where the success lies. And uh, I, I just, I love this course. Uh, I love True Function. And this is a new one that I wanted to um, announce is our Sleep and TMD panel conference that we're gonna do. This one, we're, we're really focusing on our practices that have been with us for some time or have taken a, a two day course or maybe a couple courses. And they're looking for um, more of a dialogue now and to share their case studies and to get different perspectives on all the relevant topics in the industry. As we were talking about before, you know, it's not just one philosophy that we recommend or that we teach. We want to expose you guys to different philosophies and, and for you to have the opportunity to take what works for you and develop your own philosophy from all the different perspectives that you receive. So that's the whole idea with this. And we have a multidisciplinary um, cast of speakers here, uh, the ENTs and um, we're looking to get a neurologist as well for the pain side and a couple different sleep and pain uh, dentists as well. So really looking forward to that one. And uh, yeah, we, we have a lot going on next year. Uh, a lot of new programs, and as well as our shadowing 
programs with Dr. Patel, mentorship programs, and of course, our cross-coding programs with Rose. If you want to get your team or yourself trained on how to get paid for a sleeping uh -huh. team. Um, that's the biggest, uh, biggest component. A lot of times, you know, once you get the clinical parts down is for the business perspective, how do you make it profitable? How do you get more patients in? And that's what we, we talk about at our cross coding courses, um, how to increase case acceptance for, and not just sleep in TMD, but we, we go deep into, um, billing medical for oral surgeries, implants, bone grafts, sinus lifts, um, phrenectomies. And there's so much that you can bill for that um, most practices aren't, that you can really change the dynamics of your practice. And when you become a cross-coding office, it really can make a big impact on your overall profitability. So it's a, you know, a really, really great program with cross-coding and, and with Rose. And we combine it all with the clinical side with Dr. Patel and our other speakers. So really excited for next year. I hope you can join us for one of our courses and um, I'll, I'll leave the, the final note to Dr. Patel to. Uh, yeah, sure. Tonight. Well, listen, I appreciate everybody's time. And I think the final thing I really want to say is, um, you know, I was there, I was there on the other side as you are uh, trying to get into this little area or this field, trying to navigate through what's out there and what was there back in the early uh, 2000. Things have changed. There's a lot more people that are doing this. There's a lot more people that are willing to assist you, help you, get you to be successful as well. You know, this is a running joke here in Metro Atlanta. When we do programs in Atlanta, we hardly get many local dentists that come. But when we go to other cities, we'll get people from Atlanta that will come and attend courses elsewhere. And they would ask me, like, why would we come to your course in Atlanta? Don't you take us as a direct uh, threat or competition? And every one of them gets the same answer that in all reality, actually, the more we have, the better it is for us. The more of us doing this type of work, we can get more awareness to our uh, medical colleagues, which is going to benefit every one of us. So my point here is I'm happy to help. I'm happy to assist, I'm happy to get all you guys to do what I do, uh, because at the end of the day, it is very rewarding. But more importantly, it's really benefiting patients that just don't know where to go. Uh, because we went toward in school, and medicine does not teach this in school. It's such a gray area but it's still a chronic issue that needs to be addressed. So thanks to really a platform like Human Practice Management, even Rose giving me the opportunity to lecture for them um, and, you know, trying to get my information out to you all. And for you guys to really stay in tune to the programs that they provide and, of course, the staff that supports the entire Human Practice Management process um, should also be thanked. And with that, I want to thank every one of you. Hopefully we'll see you at a course in the very near future. But if you ever have any questions or concerns, you know how to find me. Um, otherwise, I'll pass it on to you, John. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. And we will see you at a future webinar and hopefully a course coming up soon. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you all. Good evening, guys. Thank you, Leo. Good evening. Thank you, Rose. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Oh, and by the way, uh, we will be sending the recording out to everyone as well. So you'll have a copy okay. of this webinar as well.